So, Dr. Dave Hardy, welcome to the show. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about you and your sort of professional interests? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, thanks for having me first, first off. And uh, yeah, I'm Dr. David Hardy, uh, originally from Red Deer, Alberta here. I've uh, been in education before and now practice. Uh, I'm a chiropractor and also have studied in the realm of functional neurology and in functional medicine as well and practiced both of those when I was down in the in the States. So worked in North Carolina and then up in Ohio and now I'm back here and excited to be be working at Collegiate Sports and Medicine. Cool. And uh, yeah, so we're going to get into all the, the functional neurology and the brain and all that kind of stuff and uh, try and unpack that a little bit and, and uh, yeah, talk about all that weird stuff. <laughs> but before we get into that absolutely um, you know you, you've got a bit of a history yourself with uh, endurance sports and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that first just to give us some context for, for all of this yeah for sure uh, actually my original sports was basketball then I played a little bit of football and then decided I can combine the two sports and played rugby for, for a long time and uh, I just happened in my uh Early 20s, mid-20s there, uh, I took a position in Japan. And, of course, on this tiny little island I was working on, uh, they, they didn't have any rugby or team sports, really. So uh, I was doing some martial arts and also uh, made friends with a, a few people in, in the triathlon scene as well. And mm-hmm. I had never done a single long-distance event in my life and wasn't sure what I could do. Uh, uh, Japan was amazing for obviously kind of the long distance event scene. There was all sorts of small little, oh, five to five K, 10 K half marathon type type events. So I'd go in a, a few of these and slowly was bringing myself back up, up to shape after, after traveling for a while. And, uh, one of my friends on the Island, uh, a South African gentleman who, uh, who had been there for, for quite some time, was doing the Ironman on, on the island we lived. Uh, so the first year, I, I watched him do it, and of course I was training a bit with him, and then the second year I decided that I was going to do the do the Ironman as well. So my first triathlon was actually a full, full Ironman. <laughs> <laughs> and how did that go? It went great. Uh, yeah, I was really concerned about the run. Uh, sorry about the swim because I had never swam lengths ever, and uh, mm. the the swim actually became the the easiest part for myself. So okay. Uh, so did you swim in advance? Like, did you swim to prepare, or did you just was that <laughs> the first swim you did? <laughs> Absolutely, it, it took a while there. I was I was drinking a lot of pool water for for the first <laughs> first little bit there, and then. Uh, then it became the most rhythmic uh, zone out type uh, type event I, I've ever done. Like I would lose track of which lap I was on. And, mm, right. Okay. And then uh, with the Ironman being right on the on the ocean, it was wetsuit legal and salt water, so your buoyancy is is a lot better as well. So right. I actually placed myself farther back than I needed to. And mm-hmm. during the event, I found I was swimming into people. So right, okay. I so actually had to. you with the swimming. Uh, somehow I picked it up, yeah. And then the biking um, became easier and easier as I went. And then I I kind of fall off at the run part, to be honest. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, in, in what the tenth or eleventh hour, the fatigue starts to settle in a little bit. Oh, <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and and so, uh, yeah, well, I was going to say, you were what island was it in Japan? It was an island called uh, Goto. So the city we were on was uh, Fukue. And, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. It was, is, uh, is uh, Iron Man's a big deal in Japan? Was there a, was there was it a big event or? Yeah, it was uh, it was a fairly large event, obviously. And uh, in Japan too, they have the cutoff uh, two hours shorter, so it's a fifteen hour cutoff versus a seventeen hour cutoff. And it was actually one of the more hilly courses on the Iron Man scene, at, mm-hmm. at least uh, at that point in time. I, I think they've moved it from a different area now. 
but uh way back in 2006 when i did it it was it was on this yeah tiny little island outside nagasaki so Mm -hmm. it was it was quite the event for for the entire island And, and that was in 2006 you said yes yeah okay yeah so it's been been a little while and then uh my second was uh, half Ironman. Uh, I was in Cairo school at the time, <laughs> kind, and kind of went the other way about that, <laughs> right? And uh, my my rugby career came to an end from a shoulder injury, and uh, okay. I felt like I needed to do something epic again. So uh, I did the Georgia half Ironman, and then later on, I would do the Ohio half Ironman, and then in 2019, I did the Calgary one as well. Oh, yeah. okay, cool. Yeah, so. And, and so uh, somewhere in there, you, I think you were you were teaching, right, in, uh, in Japan. And yes. now, you know, you're a functional neurologist. So there's a bit of a transition there. So okay. tell us a little bit about that. Like what happened? What what led you to go back to school and why? And, and what did you study? And tell us a little bit about that path. Right. So uh, when I came back from Japan, uh, I, was, I was still a teacher and uh, taught in, in Red Deer and uh, I was teaching a middle school uh, behavioral program, uh, so I had the at-risk uh, middle school, predominantly boys, uh, that didn't fit into a regular classroom. And it was, it was quite an intensive program with, with those students, and I absolutely loved it. But uh, I kind of saw a shelf life to it. I couldn't see myself teaching that, that group of, of students for, for the rest of my career, and at the same time, I didn't want to go back to a regular classroom after having the fun students. So at that point <laughs> in time, I, I started looking more and more into, into what else I could do. And I uh, had a couple of friends that were teachers as well that uh, actually went from teaching into, into chiropractic. So I got talking to them more and more. And then uh, at that time, too, I was pretty competitive with rugby, and I thought I could probably get partial scholarship by, by playing rugby. So I went down to Life University and just outside of Atlanta, Georgia and Marietta. And, and uh, of course, the shoulder injury took me out of rugby. And then it became a blessing because I had a little extra time. <laughs> Obviously, mm-hmm. you're going through a doctorate program. So, um, But I found these postdoctorate courses and activities in functional neurology. And I just happened to be lucky that I was on the same campus where one of the lead docs in the field, Dr. Carrick, was treating Sidney Crosby and other star NHL players coming through with their concussions and all sorts of other neurological conditions. And I just gravitated to it, like the, the knowledge, the results. Uh, it, it was just mind-blowing to me and, and uh, absolutely amazing what, what we were able to do with people and, and what I was seeing these these uh, experts in, in the field doing with with all these really really difficult conditions that had taken people out of out of life and out of functioning not just out of their sport but um, and I just I just gravitated to it and so I was taking taking these courses on weekends with doctors in the field and uh, then when I graduated, I, I sat for the, the diplomate in functional neurology. So you needed uh, roughly 300 hours to sit for that examination. And uh, so I sat for that. I also took a fellowship in brain injuries. And, uh, and that was roughly about 350 postdoc hours as well. So, And after that, I, I moved to North Carolina and was practicing in a functional neurology office there. And uh, once again, working a lot with concussion, brain injuries, um, some post-addiction, uh, sometimes uh, some cognitive decline or, or developmental issues as well. So it was kind of uh, a really, really integrative practice in, in that sense. And then uh, from there, I moved uh, up to Ohio after after a little brief stint back in Canada and practiced in a functional medicine office where we were seeing a lot more kind of with the diabetes, autoimmune disorders, um, a little bit of Lyme's or MS patients coming through as well. So working more with, once again, looking at laboratory tests, metabolic, nutritional supplementation recommendations for, for 
for getting people better. So you say you said uh, you'd seen some fairly dramatic responses to, I, th- I believe you were talking about sort of functional neurolo- neurological approaches um, with uh, with athletes. What kind of things were you seeing? What got you so interested? Uh, the athletes, it was a lot more kind of, once again, kind of the, the concussions and and that aspect. So uh, we were seeing people that, that had been, yeah, to several different clinics and had had once again mediocre results or was were still still kind of out of their game or, or not able to function. So uh, there there were some amazing cases uh, that that came through uh, with with the office in North Carolina. Like uh, we'd have people coming in from from out of out of state and a few international clients come through as well. Uh, I remember this, this one lady coming through and she had a, a binder full of past medical reports. And within a matter of a few intensive programs, we were able to get her back to work and, and functioning. So, hmm. uh, it was, it was just, <laughs> just success cases. And, and once again, just extremely rewarding to, to see these people that that have problems basically standing on their own feet being able to now function and go back to work and and being a mother daughter or our family member as well so and then w- w- i don't think it'll be a term that's familiar to all the listeners so how would mm-hmm. you explain what a functional urologist is or what the field is to to to, to the lay person you know what what right what does it mean absolutely so basically in the alternative world, all sorts of modalities, stimulations, exercises, uh, they all basically stimulate a receptor that obviously goes through a nerve, up through the spinal cord, and to some place in the brain. So different exercises have obviously uh, come across in the research as being able to, to stimulate the brain and have positive results with the brain. So instead of tracking it that way, uh, Basically, these pioneers in the field decided, well, why don't we take the neurologic examination and backtrack? Okay, so it's this part of the brain. What fires into that part of the brain so we can stimulate it and develop the connections in it so it works better? Mm-hmm. And uh, Sorry. Yep. So kind of the, the easier example is basically we're trying to find ways to hack the brain and nervous system to, to get people better. And it's not so much the tool that we use, it's either a combination of tools, but really getting specific with what regions of the brain need that exercise or stimulation, and then firing into that system at a frequency, intensity, duration to actually make a change to it. And you mentioned that you sort of, it originated from a, a working back of the neurological examination. Now, that now to me, that's somewhat familiar, but for the listener, what, what kind of examination techniques are, would a neurologist sort of look at and how do you guys sort of reverse engineer them to, to use them as a treatment? Right, absolutely. So the neurologic examination has been around for decades. There's textbooks on it. So we're running basically the same uh, bedside neurologic exam that, that an MD neurologist would do. The difference is we're looking for those functional imbalances to apply our, our stimulations and exercises to. So a lot's going to deal with, of course, the functions of the brain from primitive structures like heart rates, autonomic function, respiration. Uh, we see those go haywire all the time in concussion patients. We're going to be looking at different vestibular aspects, so balance, coordination, muscle movements, tonicity of different muscles, different eye movements. Eye movements are a huge one because different eye movements will tell us about different parts of the brain because it fires through so many different different pathways. Uh, So once again, eye movements are going to be a big one. Then, of course, look at some of the cognition. We can run online cognitive tests, and we've done several of those. Look into different laboratory exams, too, to see, okay, is there a metabolic component, too, that we can uh, support and and 
help the, the cells actually heal instead of constantly being degenerated and, and, uh, and functioning at a, at a lower level metabolically. And then, of course, the stimulation into that system to, once again, develop those connections and get the firing in that part of the brain to be appropriate. So, so it's, it's a million-piece puzzle. Yeah. But uh, the, the great thing is there's, there's, once again, kind of these patterns that we find in different connections and, and looking at, at uh, different pathways. Then we can trace it back to which receptor we kind of need to stimulate, whether it's different cranial nerve stimulation, whether it's different coordination exercises, vestibular um, stimulation, whether it's, it's an adjustment, whether we're coupling different things together, because uh, if it's a damaged neuronal pool and there's a viable pathway right beside it, quite commonly they're interconnected. So you can use one exercise to stimulate a, a neuronal pool close to it. So sometimes it's a combination of exercises, once again, specifically in the right part of the brain that's, that's not functioning properly that, that make the big results. And you say, um, you know, you use the word functional a few times there and sort of, I think most people would, when you say there's a, you know, a fairly classical neurological exam, you know, people I imagine people following the pen with their eyes and touching the nose and, you know, uh, turning the hand over this kind of stuff. So you, and then you say you're looking for these subtle uh, asymmetries and stuff. Uh, so would that imply that, you know, usually um, doctors are not looking for s things that are quite so subtle. They're usually doing this to look for more marked deficits that would, might indicate, uh, you know, a, like a stroke or a multiple sclerosis or something like that. And you, the, the, the way you're using and your, the people in your field are using the examination as a little more, would it functional in this sense mean trying to classify your performance on these different uh, tests into optimal versus suboptimal instead of uh, present versus absent? Is that is that what's going on in this sort of with the with the term functional and sort of differentiating what you guys are doing that's new? Absolutely. Uh, so the neurologic examination has traditionally been used to yeah rule out different stroke uh, tumors or pathologies where as in a concussion uh, you can't they're going to be be more subtle especially the higher functioning that person is so like when you're working with pro athletes their brain their their timing systems are through the roof good but after a concussion, they still might look good, but they're still damaged. Hmm. So the analogy I use with that is those subtle differences is like in a star athlete is like a Ferrari being damaged. Like it still yeah. might look really good, but there's something going wrong. So the higher functioning a, a person is, obviously the better some of these, these signs are. So they can quite commonly be missed. And the other thing about the brain is there's a big push-pull between one side and the other. So balance is always, always one that, that uh, comes, comes to mind in, in that analogy is because, well, you got a balance system on the right and a balance system on the left. Well, if the left is damaged more, that becomes the vestibular difference. And people really relate to that is, yeah, I, I feel like I'm, when I got knocked, I was falling this direction even when I was... I was upright. And while the same thing happens in different parts of, of the brain is there's a big push-pull between one side or the other or an on-off between one side and the other. And the other thing is they both use the same chemicals. So the left vestibular system uses the same chemicals as the right system. But if you damage the left and the right is functioning well, if you use a chemical to treat it, it's never going to take away that imbalance. If you use a bilateral therapy, you're probably not going to get rid of that imbalance in the system. So you really need to look at those subtle differences in, in how the, the system's functioning from side to side. And what do, just for the listener, what do you mean by vestibular system? 
Vestibular is going to be one of the orientation systems that keep us up on, on our feet. Vestibular is actually our inner ear, our balance center, but that's going to be integrated with eye movements and proprioception, so feedback from muscles and joints as well. So all of that keeps us up on our feet. And then how this applies to like long distance runners is, well, we've got those three systems coming together and you might notice basically just as a, as a PT chiropractor muscle imbalances where one muscle is tighter than the other. Well, if they're postural muscles, we are commonly not looking at this integration of those three systems. So you might have a different tonality, say, in your shoulder and your hamstring, and it can be postural. And it, it will be subtle, as you know, when, when we see people in the, in, in the examinations we do. But when you take them and you really fatigue out that postural system in the brain, then you really see it come through in, in that last few miles or, or kilometers of, of an event. You... Mm -hmm. You really start to see those long distance athletes that are struggling to get to get to the line start to have different twisting and torquing so once again you're seeing that that uh, control over the postural system start to fade so these little imbalances we see on when we're stretching people out quite commonly too can be be a problem with with uh, the primitive areas of the brain whether it's cerebellar whether it's the brain stem or whether it's inhibition from, from our frontal lobes. And these would occur within an otherwise you know, normal person. So we're not talking about someone who's had a brain lesion of some sort. We're talking about, you know, you could do these tests on me and you have and pond, little deficits and little, <laughs> little uh, I guess the word might be functional deficits in these systems. And what can be done about that? You know, is, is this something that can be affected in, a, in some sort of way to, to produce a, uh, a performance increase, a, a reduction in injuries or recurring injuries on one side or something like that? Absolutely. And yeah, everything's kind of on a spectrum from pathology all the way up to peak performance. So everybody's going to have these sensory mismatches because... There's just so much information coming into the brain and developmental periods are different. Learning and experiences all, of course, are going to form different connections in the brain. So we all have, have these sensory mismatches. The, the key is, well, how bad are they and how good do you want your performance? So all of these can be trained. If you know the deficit then it's a matter of, once again, stimulating or exercising that part of the brain or our nervous system and doing it at a, at a rate that the brain learns it. So if you only did an exercise once a day um, or once a week, you're not going to really get that, that part of the brain to learn it too well. It, it's going to take longer. Um, if you do it for too long, sometimes you can fatigue these, these parts of the brain. And then in, intensity is another, another component. So whether it's how to balance better and have better gait strides, whether, you, whether it, you feel like you're more anterior versus posterior, you might overstride or understride. It might be a different leg length in, in the gait analysis from one side to the other. And... Uh, if, if you're going to train these, it, it's got to be multiple times to develop that. So I always use the analogy, well, if I was to give you some math homework or uh, teach you how to play tennis or play the piano or how not to be dizzy, you've got to do it at, once again, a frequency, intensity, duration to actually get that part of the brain to come together and, and learn it. So that becomes the other key aspect. And in somebody who's really damaged and injured, obviously it's got to be low duration, low intensity, but high frequency to make those changes. But somebody who's healthier, then obviously you can increase the intensity and duration as well. And what might be an example of something you would expect to see or that you see often in 
let's say, a, a runner, but let's say more recreational runner, they're just getting started. They don't do tons. They maybe are training for their first race or something like that. Is there is there patterns to the deficits that you see uh, based on the profile of the, the runner or the athlete in front of you? Oh, definitely. And yeah, long distance events are, uh, are really good to actually pick out the, the gate imbalances. Uh, and yeah, it, it also is dependent on which race I've done because, uh, in, in Calgary, it was, it was a smaller event than say I did in Ohio or in, uh, in, uh, Georgia. But the interesting thing was down in the States, you had kind of more people who were more out of shape doing these events. Mm -hmm. and yeah of course you, you notice that the the shorter stride on one side or the the tilt of the pelvis differently in the gait and the biggest thing too is yeah you, you notice people that are first out running is the thud when they hit the ground versus Just like one side or, or both sides both sides usually but one side's worse than the other and on a treadmill, you can hear it. <laughs> right, yeah. It's a different I rhythm. I noticed that before. And, but you, you look at the, the athletes that are winning marathon races, and when they strike the ground, it's quick back up, and there's not much, much actual foot contact. So basically, their postural systems know where their body is, and they know where it's going more effectively and efficiently. So when they hit the ground, the, the force is transferred right away versus mm. somebody who's, who's new at it and doesn't have that, that integrity is, is much. And you're going to notice once again, kind of more the, the thud and harder hits and longer time, the foot's on the ground. You're, you're commonly going to have. Yeah. Sorry. Um, it just it got me thinking the way we think about, high performing endurance athletes usually is where the best ones are the ones with the best heart and lungs <laughs> you know that's the <laughs> right. kind of way you look at it it's that there's not much regard given for skill i don't think when it comes to endurance athletes we we think the talented ones are sort of they have good lungs and good capillary networks in their muscles and all this kind of stuff we don't uh, where someone you know if you think of a you know, uh, Messi uh, playing football, you don't think it's because of his heart and lungs that he's the best footballer. He's the most skillful, you know, it's... Um, right, absolutely. It's, it's interesting. You don't really think of running as a skill or biking as a skill, but from the, as you were talking now, I was thinking, yeah, well, it makes sense. It's a, still a movement that it might be more difficult to see the differences in skill level because the, the movement is more similar when when I play football, the difference between me and Messi is quite apparent, right? <laughs> when I run, <laughs> I look kind of similar <laughs> to, to a lot of good runners. But the, the differences in quality may be subtler. Is that is that something you're sort of getting at there with the difference in elite versus uh, more uh, recreational or amateur runners? Oh, definitely, too. And in other sports, it's still running, right? They're shifting direction more often, obviously. And yeah, you'll see the, the, the athletes like say in soccer, football, rugby that can sidestep. Once again, it's kind of the same mechanism when that, that strike is made, it's not on the ground long before the whole body mm -hmm. is able to coordinate that movement at a speed and accuracy that is just out of this world versus someone that's, that's obviously hasn't practiced or developed that as well. So, and it's, yeah, we look at heart and lungs. All of that is supporting fuel to the nervous system mm -hmm. and muscles. So it's not just that, yeah, better heart and lungs, you get the oxygenation to, to the muscles so that they're able to go longer and perform longer. The, the greediest part of the, our physiology is our brain and nervous system. Mm -hmm. It uses roughly about a quarter of all, all the fuel that, that mm -hmm. we take in. And this is one of the reasons, too, that in the long distance events, you start to notice the by the end of the event, more of a decline in these systems as mm -hmm. as the person's moving through it. OK, so it's 
Yeah, I always thought, because it's, everybody knows, especially when you do a longer event, like something that's long for you, any kind of run that's longer than, much longer than you would normally go, you can feel it at the end. The quality of your movement has diminished. And, you know, I think we already always put that down to fatigue, but I never really thought of it as a, a neurological kind of fatigue. Uh, but it makes sense because, as you say, the, the nervous system soaks up loads of oxygen and uh, glucose and it's not going to perform as well when it's running out of those things. Right. And yeah, you look at the, the athletes like in the long marathon events that are almost passing out before the finish line. It's not just muscle fatigue. It, you don't pass out without once again, something going on with, hmm. with fuel delivery to the brain. So, and so, so it does become that, that huge fatigue factor in, in these, these other systems. So the more efficient they are, then the better they use fuel as well. So that we, we combine, obviously, the gait training. So it's, it's neuromuscular re-education is, is a, kind of the, the buzz phrase for, for what you're doing with, with the gait assessment. And I've seen you use metronome as well. So you're, you're working on the timing systems, the cerebellum, obviously, and all of these put together are going to make those systems much more sharp so that they don't fit, use as much fuel because an inefficient system is going to obviously chew up more oxygen, glucose, or ketones. So the more efficient you can make it beforehand too, the, the better the, the fuel delivery. And then too, when you're training, you can build up that heart and lung system as well. So it's, it's not just, just one, it's all interconnected. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. So you your training may be improving aspects of your nervous system that you just you're just not aware of. You're just not thinking about it. You, you, that's not the intention of the training, but that might be part of the reason you get better with time. I was just wondering, you you know, you were talking about being efficient with your uh, the the neurological system or the neuromuscular system being efficient. Does this also apply to other areas of the brain. So if, if the nervous system and the brain, right, so we got the nerves, we got the spinal cord, we got the brain, it's your nervous system. And it's it's soaking up, what did you say, 25% of the, the the calories from the, um, out of the blood. Does, is, is part of the, you know, the reason you might be a better long distance athlete than someone else is part of that related more towards uh, I don't know I'm imagining them sort of shutting down other areas of their brain that aren't useful so they're not thinking right. about certain things or they're not subconsciously processing for certain things is that I don't know am I just talking nonsense <laughs> not at all actually and that's that's a great thing about long distance events is uh, it is kind of uniplanar and so what happens is of course, all that information is coming through. So our cerebellum, that back part of the brain, has roughly about 50, 60% of all the neurons in the entire brain. But it deals with coordination of both muscles, movements, and thoughts. Uh, so it's, it's got, a, got a huge role in the brain. And it's got a system called the Purkinje system, if you wanted to get technical, where basically the more information coming into it that's the same then it starts to inhibit the information it sends out to the other parts of the brain so by doing uniplanar movements you actually get more filtering of that sensory information going up to the other parts of the brain that would excite other parts of the brain and that's why you kind of get that zone out feel instead of having all these racing thoughts so okay I was with you and then I lost you and then I found you again. Could we, could, <laughs> could you explain that to me again? A little bit as if I'm a little bit dumber than you. All uh, right. So <laughs> basically, that one again. Right. So basically when you do the same thing over and over, okay. it becomes repetitive to the brain. So it actually sent you actually, your brain spends less time thinking about it and less resources. Right. It's like driving, something. right? Like you, when you're driving, you don't pay as much attention after a few years as you, or you don't seem to as the, the day you learn to drive where you can barely, barely do it. And you, it's all you can think about. And then now you do it and you're like, did I just drive here or what? Like, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
And people gravitate to different sports because different sports are going to send different information to the brain. So quite commonly in long distance athletes, it's that zone of feel like you've just had a horrible day at work and then you go for a run and you forget about your day type thing. That that's, that's great. And then afterwards, of course, you got all the, all the great feeling of, of working your, your body and other people though, they, they gravitate to like, tumbling sports or to speed sports. So that's going to be more vestibular input. So they're trying to excite a different part of the brain and that gives them a different feeling or sensation. Oh, okay. So, and then, so with that repetitive motion, you're saying that that what happens sort of physiologically is that the cerebellum looks at that information and after a while communicates to other part of the brain saying it's okay i can handle this you guys can do something else is that what's going on exactly yeah the cerebellum is kind of your autom automatic center of the brain it's it's something that just kind of, kind of becomes entrenched so yeah the, the easier it can handle it then then the brain's not going to spend as much time thinking about other things because that part of the brain obviously needs that attention and is taken care of of the job you're doing at the time. That's interesting because um, I know there is some research to show that people become, their running economy approved naturally with just training age, you know, how long they've mm -hmm. been a runner. They will burn less oxygen at a given pace than someone, you know, equally matched for fitness who is running at the same speed. And, uh, you know, again, you sort of gravitate to the more, I don't know, concrete or uh, that's not the right word the, the the easier to 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 comprehend uh, physiological systems like the the muscles the 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 uh, blood vessels i'm not doing very right. well with my words here but, <laughs> um, but what you're saying is it could be that actually they're just getting neurologically more efficient they're not wasting as much energy sending electrical messages all over their brain and nervous system because they're just like i know how to do this it's uh, it's easy Absolutely. That, that's going to be a huge part of it. There's also, of course, the, the heart, lung, physiology, metabolic right. side that, yeah. it's, it's that you're talking. Not, yeah. And there's crosstalk between the two. Mm -hmm. So basically in the research, it's the neuroendocrine immune system. You can't really separate those, those three systems. They're all communication systems. And the, the whole future of healthcare as it's being disrupted is ways to hack the communication systems in the body. Mm -hmm. So there's multiple, multiple avenues in there and they're, they're all cross talking between each other. So the, the better your brain's running, the better signals down through your vagus nerve to, to different organs, that system's going to be better. So, so once again, better neurological function is better cardiac function as well and vice yeah. versa because if cardiac function goes down, then obviously blood flow goes down and you're not going to get that fuel to the brain so all of its intertwined systems working together and and the thing is to clinically find which ones have the weaknesses so once again you can make a change to, to those systems and again i mean that's the tricky thing because i know i like to try and give people you know sort of diy stuff right but right absolutely does this approach lend itself to any kind of take-home things to to look at or think about or is it really kind of silly to do it like that it needs to be looked at by a functional neurologist who can then try something and you know and see if it's working at a review and that kind of thing or is this stuff that runners can look at themselves or do you know what i mean yeah absolutely uh so with runners uh like we've been talking about the cerebellum and usually once again cerebellum balance coordination it's going to be weaker on one side so different things like coordination tests you can do yourself so things like quick finger movements is one side slower than the other do you have freezes pauses so you just top, sort of like you're a lobster you're sort of yeah exactly top. <laughs> so as um, wide as you can and as fast as you can okay hang on. Uh, well, i'm definitely quicker on the left and you're not very wide, though. <laughs> I'm not very wide on the left. Am I wide on the right? <laughs> so as wide as you can, as fast as you can. Oh, wide man, and fast. Tiring very quick. See what Absolutely. you mean about that sort of neurological fatigue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, no, I'm faster on the right. <laughs> and then a good, another good one to test coordination on one side is just your alternating hand one. If you start okay. to get a flappy fish on one side, that's going to be your weaker right, center of so bellum. audio listeners, I'm holding my hands up, palms up, and then I'm going to turn them over and reverse uh, again and again. So I'm turning them one way up and then the other. Is that right? Correct, yeah. All right, here we go. And as fast as you can go. <laughs> so what do you see? <laughs> They're both kind of floppy. You know, we got to work on your cerebellum. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> and actually for the audio listeners, what you can do is basically clap the back of your hand, front of your hand. So you're alternating back, front, hitting the center on center as fast as you can. And you'll actually start to hear the difference in that timing. And okay. if once why don't you do your right arm and then your left arm, and I'll close my eyes and see if I can hear anything. All right. Well, it's much slower on that second one. Yeah, so that would be my less, left cerebellum. Less realm. precise as well. It was more... Exactly, and the brain is just all about accuracy and timing. So accuracy of movements and timing of movements. So, and what's the what's the takeaway there? If you see, so um, I mean, there we see. Okay, there's a little deficit there. The the cerebellum on one side of your brain doesn't seem to be quite as precise. So, uh, exactly. The, so, what you're going to do is you're going to do coordination exercises only on that side of the body. Right. So, so then you're trying to increase um, neurological function, specifically on where you have the weakness, like you said, as opposed to doing things on both sides where you might do like a balance practice or a learning coordination drill, you're always going to do both sides, right? Uh, Correct. What you're yeah. saying is that you would just target the, so for me, I mean, for my hands, I was a bit rubbish in both, but I think you with your <laughs> left hand, you would work on that one specifically. And how would you work on it? What would that look like? It can be simple things as just doing like three sets of 10 figure eights. Um, and then you might want to advance to doing it opposite directions on the same side. So you would do a figure eight with your foot one direction. And with your arm, you'd go the other way. Okay, so you're giving a sort of um, a fairly simple but a, a quite a novel coordination challenge. Exactly. And, it's and kind, kind of the old... Landing that the cerebellum... Um, up its game a little bit is that on that side is that the thinking correct yeah so that's why it's one why would it be one arm on one side and the foot on the other side or is it on the same side same side okay sorry i was yeah. confused yeah and you'd want to do more balance activities on that same side as well things like standing on one leg and then maybe doing your figure eights at the same time and that kind of stuff exactly yeah and then and how, how much improvement are you looking for? And how, you know, so we take that original test mm -hmm. where we're tapping. How, how long do we expect that to take to, to change? Uh, it can change really quickly, um, but basically it depends on how often somebody works works on it. So it's one of those things. You're, you're just trying to stimulate the cerebellum with something novel and new. So it always takes more brain power to learn something new. So that's why you do opposite directions. And if you're doing multiple directions, then of course it's more novel to the brain than doing the same directions. Mm -hmm. So you just want to send a stimulation into that part of the brain, let it learn it, then wait for a while, then do another stimulation, let it learn it. So you're just getting the firing of that part of the brain to, to kick up a little bit. And then... The goal of this is to sharpen that deficit up. Let's, for simplicity, stay, mm -hmm. stick with the, like, the left cerebellum. You want improvement in left cerebellar coordination. And Absolutely. you expect that to result in a more skillful running, um, is technique the word? Or, or, or? Yep. Yeah, and basically, yeah, it's going to transfer into, into better running technique because your postural systems are going to adapt and, and be firing equally from one side to the other. And then potentially less inefficiency in the neurological system, uh, you know, further to what we were talking about earlier, where 
elite people will be more efficient with their use of their neurological energy. You're expecting this to be improved by doing these kinds of exercises to sort of sharpen up your own little deficits that you find. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the other great thing about the cerebellum is it fires over to the opposite frontal lobe and the frontal lobes, 90% of its function is actually inhibition. So you'll get better inhibition of autonomic function. So sometimes we'll do this in people that have had, had, horrible concussions or brain injuries. And we notice that there's a difference in a pupil from one side to the other, blood pressure from one side to the other. And that's that inhibition is, is being taken away. So we can actually track and record improvements um, by doing these movements, by looking at, at the inhibition centers, firing down to the, the autonomic centers. Because the better the brain function, once again, the autonomic system doesn't fire as much. And you see it in, in, in neurodevelopment as well. We were born, we're more in that fetal flex position. We get more extensor tone, inhibition of flexors. Okay? Our autonomics go from being high heart rate. Our emotionality obviously goes from a lot of laughing, crying into being more stable. And then when you see these systems deteriorate as we age, we see more of that flexor posture as well because we lose that inhibition. And we see autonomics start to go up as well. So we can triangulate it to, to all sorts of different functions in, in different populations as well, whether aging, injured, or, or anything else that would, would affect our, our neurometabolic system. For that reason, would you expect these kinds of interventions to be more effective at the extremes of age? Um, you know, when potentially there's more room for improvement or not so much? You're going to see, see obviously, the numbers go from being farther apart to a better, better range if the pathway is viable versus in a high-performing athlete, you're, you're dealing with little changes and little right. subtleties in that system. So once again, like, you, you take somebody, though, in a sport that it's, it's a split-second decision. Well, if you're able to, to get the, the nervous system and the coordination working even a split-second better, then look at how many people they've just passed. Hmm. And opposite, well, you look at a hockey, football player, rugby player, somebody who's had a concussion, and they're used to having that split-second decision-making. And all of a sudden, that's taken away from them because of that that hit. Then they're going to fall out of out of their their place in in on their team very quickly. They're they're not going to perform at that high level where the stakes are once again measured in just just split second second muscle movements. Yeah, it's interesting as well to think about like there's always those people and you you notice it more when you're in school age right because you're all playing sports all the time but there's just some kids who are just awesome at everything you know they're just they're, they're just right. naturals yeah. at every sport they play including running which wouldn't you know if you don't again you don't think of running as a particularly skillful thing or riding a bike but they're good at those things too you know and it's perhaps there's something about the sort of potency of their nervous system to to adopt postures and movements and efficiently and quickly and change from one to another and coordinate those things that sort of uh, transcends the, the sort of boundaries of each sport. Absolutely. Yeah. And in running too, you, some people might, might think it's, it's not a, a skilled thing, but because, well, yeah, maybe they're not chasing a ball or something else, but you're performing <laughs> a task over and over that needs to be precise and the more precise you can do for the longer period of time is actually a huge feat in itself and yeah. the people that that can't do an accurate movement over and over and over again are the ones that that obviously fall farther and farther back in a, in a race or they have to be that much fitter like cardiovascularly or cardio respiratory wise to compensate for that inefficiency in movement. Exactly. Yeah. You got to work harder 
And mm -hmm. then what we see in long distance events is they're pushing themselves all the way to that limit. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, there's the only so much <laughs> hard, yeah, there's only so much hard work you can do and that and yeah. willpower. And then, then it's, it's toast. Whereas yeah, it's like pushing a, pushing a car with a, with the parking brake on, right? You, you got to take yeah. a car. You can't do it. But you <laughs> and that's a huge difference when you, when you see like an ultra marathoner versus somebody who's just picking up a 5k on a weekend <laughs> type thing. Mm. Yeah, it yeah, is. because the you know you just extrapolate an inefficiency across whatever it is three thousand steps an hour. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a twenty minute race. It does matter if it's a twenty hour race. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, that that was really interesting, uh, Doctor Hardy. Thank you for coming on to join us. I, I'm sure people would be interested to learn more about this and more about you is there anywhere they could go maybe online to find you and, and read a little bit more learn a little bit more from you right uh the collegiate sports medicine uh, website uh, just look under functional neurology and then of course I, I regularly post on on our social media as well and then too i've got uh got uh, an overlapping social media with uh, the hardy brain so the Hardy Brain on Facebook or on Instagram as well. So, okay, I can put links to those in the descriptions for anyone who wants to wants to check that out. And uh, thank you again for coming on to talk about all the weird stuff of uh, <laughs> functional neurology and brains and nervous systems. This was a nice uh, change of direction. It was very interesting. Thanks. Absolutely, it was, it was great to geek out about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just stopped the recording there, mate.